so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me Good morning. So glad you're here, ready to worship Jesus Christ here at the Journey Church. Well, we are right now in a sermon series in Acts, and Acts has 28 chapters. This past Sunday, we just finished Acts 14, which is halfway right in the middle of this 28 chapters in the book of Acts. And then we're going to start today into something a little bit deeper, and then next Sunday, we'll move into Acts chapter 15. Today's sermon title and passage is Growing God's Kingdom by Growing Church Planting. Growing God's Kingdom by Growing Church Planting. And today's passage is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's our main passage. We'll have some other supplemental passages, but our main passage is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Please be turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, Verse 8, in our current sermon series in the book of Acts, we are able to see how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit led the beginning of the church age to come into being. But before the church age began, and the Holy Spirit being the one to come and guide and empower the believers, Jesus taught the new believers His purpose and plan guaranteed only by his authority and his power. Keep your place in Acts 1-8, and let's go back to the Gospels for just a moment. We need to see two verses in Matthew and one verse in Acts that set up the coming church age and who would be involved with its implementation and generational growth. On the slide, you'll see three verses. Two are in the Gospels, and one is in the very beginning of the book of Acts. Matthew 16, 18. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overpower it. It was wonderful that this was the very first verse that we taught in our church plant. We taught it on a Wednesday night, and it was September 2nd of 2009. I'll never forget it. That's how we felt led to start this church, is that I'm not going to grow the church. You're not going to grow the church. Jesus says that he will build his church. And so when he said Peter, Peter means Petra, means rock. It wasn't building the church on Peter. That's what the Catholics think. And so they made too much of Peter in his ministry. It was that Jesus said that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It was the gospel that God was going to build his church on and Jesus would be that cornerstone. Then that's at the beginning or toward the middle of Matthew, but look at how Matthew ends. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, and that word there doesn't mean just look over, it means obey. So teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then as Jesus has been uh, killed, so he's dead, buried, and resurrected, and then right before he ascends, he gives them instructions for them to go and do personal evangelism, but also these men are going to go and plant churches. There's going to be bodies of Christ, local bodies of Christ. Acts 1-8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Can you tell how that little small concentric circle is growing? You can see that he starts right there in Jerusalem, and then all Judea, then Samaria, and then the remotest part of the earth. If you were to get on a plane here, and you could go nonstop to Israel, which you can't, there's layovers, but if you could, you'd be in the air 17 hours going very, very fast, like three to four or five hundred miles an hour. So you've got a lot of time and distance between us and Jerusalem. So we are part of the remotest part of the earth. So when you look at the United States and being here in Texas, now we have churches being planted here. With these three scriptures, all from Jesus himself, 
How are believers in Jesus to move forward after coming to faith in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior? You might be surprised to find out how many hundreds and even thousands of people pray to Jesus Christ to be their personal Lord and Savior, then seek to live out their Christian lives as Lone Rangers. They believe that they do not need a local church home in order to become a Christian or stay a Christian. And that's true. They also believe that they can become just as good of a Christian by worshiping only from home. That simply is not true. Sure, they can read their Bibles. They can pray. They can sing worship songs. They can confess their sins. They can show hospitality to a, two peop- to a few people in their home. They can watch a sermon on TV or YouTube every now and then. But that's about all. Jesus never intended for a Christian to live their life alone or in isolation. The Christian life and experience of God is expressly created by the Godhead to be within a body of believers, a family coming together regularly to worship Jesus, study and learn about Jesus, give to Jesus, serve Jesus, Then go out and witness about Jesus and also invite others to the Savior and to come to church to experience life within the body of believers. Think about sports for just a moment. If an athlete desires to play football, basketball, baseball, soccer, or hockey, they can't just go out onto a field or a frozen lake and play the sport all by themselves. They need a team. They need others to play. Even a sport like tennis where you have a single player needs at least one other person to play with them in order to have a game to play. The Christian life was never designed to be lived out by yourself. The Christian life involves six overarching processes of growing, equipping, and reaching. The Christian life involves six overarching processes of growing, equipping, and reaching. Number one, a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ. This means they are saved, that they've been forgiven from their sins. Number two, the new believer, the new Christian, is baptized soon thereafter. Number three, the saved person then joins a local body of believers and starts learning and growing and being equipped in Jesus Christ. Number four, the church grows spiritually, which means it also begins to grow numerically. And as we have been seeing in the book of Acts, this is true. So if a church is going to grow numerically, it must grow spiritually. Number five, each believer in the church begins to be very fruitful in coming to worship regularly and starting intentionally reaching out to others in their sphere of influence and inviting them to church so that they too can come to faith in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior and be baptized. Point number six, this process repeats over and over and over and over. Amen? There is no version in the Bible where a lost person comes to faith in Jesus Christ and they can just decide to not join a local church, a local body of believers, and just learn and give and serve and witness on their own. They are not allowed by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who created the church to just worship as they please and just stay home and rob God of all that God has called His church to be and do. That is simply Americanized Christianity. That is not biblical Christianity. Now, please allow me to show you why from God's Word. First, let's look at our mandate from the Lord in the book of Hebrews. Notice that this verse is one very long sentence. Every phrase separated by a comma is a very necessary part of Christian life and of a local body of believers. So write down this passage and go back this week. If you're always searching for where do I study or what should I have in my quiet time, go back and to look at this verse. Keep your bulletin in your Bible and look at this verse and walk through it like we're walking today and I hope the light bulb will click on. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, verse 24. 
And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Did you know that as believers, even though we're believers, we're still sinners, we are each to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Left to your own doing, you won't do that. It works better with the body. So let us consider. What does consider mean? Let us think through. Let us pray about. Let us kind of contemplate on how we can stimulate one another in the body of Christ in order to grow in love and to witness of the love of Christ and to do good needs in our Savior's name. If we're constantly doing that with one another, if you're helping me and I'm helping you and you're helping each other, if we're constantly considering how to stimulate one another, what does that mean? Stimulate, move to action, encourage them, get off the couch from being a couch potato, love Jesus. Now look at verse 25. Still there's a comma there. This is the same sentence. Not forsaking our own assembling together. Meaning don't stop coming to worship. Don't stop meeting together. Don't start, stop being with your family. Not forsaking our own assembling together. Now watch this. As is the habit of some. There are a lot of born again believers that have made a habit of not going to church, not going to worship, not being with the body of Christ, not being with the bride of Christ. They made a very bad habit of staying home. And they've got all kind of rationalizations, all kind of reasons, all kind of false excuses. But there is no real reason to not come and be part of the body of Christ and fellowship and stimulate one another onto loving good deeds. Now, if you're in assisted living and you're in lockdown, you can't come and be with the body. If you're flat on your back and you can never move again and you're in a nursing home about to die, you can't come and be part of the body. A lot of the body needs to go to you, but you can't come and be with the body, right? Or if you're in ICU in a coma, you can't come and be a part of the body. I understand those reasons, and those are reasons that mean you cannot. Any other reason outside of that means you will not. But we are to come together to the family of God, to the body of Christ. And by the way, you do realize that the church is not the brick and mortar. It's not the building. The church is the body of Christ, the believers, those born again. So, as is that bad habit of some, but encouraging one another. Don't we all get discouraged? We all get discouraged. If you haven't seen a brother or sister in church in a while, what do you need to do? You need to get out the church directory. You need to call and say, hey, I need a number on this person. I need an email on this person. You need to reach out and say, are you okay? And they're like, yeah, why? Well, I haven't seen you in church. Well, you know, I've just been really busy at work and da-da-da-da-da, or so-and-so died and I've just been down and depressed or, you know, all the COVID stuff or whatever the reason is. We need to reach out and say, hey, it's expected that we gather together regularly with the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, to come together as the church and worship. And you know what? I knew something might be wrong. I just wanted to call and tell you, you are loved and you are missed. Isn't it sad when churches even grow to the sizes where most of the spiritual leaders don't even know you're a member of their church? And you never get a phone call if you're sick or out or depressed or down or your work schedule changed. Thank God for small churches where if you see somebody that's not there, then you can reach out and say, hey, I just want to encourage you, and how can we help you to be part of the body again? And all the more as you see the day drawing near. All the more, meaning we need to do this more and more and more and more. Can you see the fever pitch? Can you see how it's supposed to increase, not decrease, and not even stay flat? We need to do this all the more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? The day of Christ's return. The end of this time. And so, as we roll along and we click off each day in a year's calendar, we're getting closer to that day. Did you realize that today you are closer than the coming of Jesus Christ than you were last week? And then the previous week? And then the previous week? And then tomorrow, if God should tarry, if you wake up on Monday morning, you are closer on Monday to the day of Christ than you were today on Sunday. Every day we live, we are getting close to that day that's already marked in heaven's calendar and God's divine calendars when Jesus Christ is to come back. We are getting closer to the day it's drawing near. Second, let's look at how Peter and Paul went about teaching and preaching in the book of Acts. There are many scriptures that speak directly to the setting up of a body of believers. But for the sake of time, let's just look at two verses. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 14 through 15. 
1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. This is Paul writing. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Did you know that there is a way that a believer is to conduct himself in the household of God? This wouldn't make any sense if it was okay for believers to just stay home and not participate in a local body, in the household of God, another place where a local place where people were born again and saved and doing life in Christ. I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, comma, which is the church of the living God. Now watch this. The pillar and support of the truth. The church of the living God is the pillar and support of the truth. If you're not going to participate in a local body, you're not going to understand what that pillar is. You're not going to understand what that support is like. You're not going to be sitting there under the truth at all times and iron sharpening iron and you living out the truth. You have to be part of the household of God the church of the living God, and be there, which is the pillar and support of the truth. You know, so many people today feel like things are out of control. Things are uncertain. Things are just chaotic. We don't have any idea what's coming next. We don't know anything about our economy. We don't know what's going to happen with businesses. We don't know what's going to happen with churches. We don't know what's going to happen with schools. We don't know what's going to happen with our health. We just don't know. But did you know there's a place that you can come regularly? That you can come to the household of God and be blended in with the church of the living God. And you can be there in its pillars and support of the truth of God. Now here's seven startling facts. And it's entitled, An Up-Close Look at Church Attendance in America. And it's written by church leaders. Church leaders is the name of an organization of spiritual leaders that look at what's happening statistically and with polls about the American church. Seven startling facts. An Up-Close Look at Church Attendance in America. Written by the organization, Church Leaders. This was written in April of 2018. You can find it on the internet. What's the latest on church attendance in America? And he gives seven startling facts. Number one, less than 20% of Americans regularly attend church. Number one, less than 20% of Americans regularly attend church. Now do the math with me, folks. Doesn't that also mean 80% of Americans do not attend church regularly? Number two, American church attendance is steadily declining. I don't think that's news to you, but I think it's worthy of mentioning here in his article. Number two, American church attendance is steadily declining declining. And by the way, we're getting closer and closer and closer to the return of Christ, right? That day is getting closer every day we live and church attendance is declining as Jesus gets closer to his arrival. Point number three, only one state is outpacing its population growth. You understand what that means as you're doing a census and you can find out this state's population of people is growing higher and higher and higher only one state is out past pacing its population growth. That's the state of Hawaii. Hawaii is keeping pace, but all of the other 49 states are not. Number four, mid-sized churches are shrinking. The smallest and largest churches are growing. But that doesn't necessarily mean small churches as in church plants are growing. But small churches and mainly those that have ministries those that have programming, and even the larger churches. Number five, established churches, those that are 40 to 190 years old, are on average declining. If your church is over 40 years old, up to 190 years old, on average, they're declining. The churches under 40, from zero to 40, are doing better. Number six, The increase in churches is only a quarter of what's needed to keep up with population growth. 
the increase, meaning more church plants, more churches putting out church plants, the increase in churches is only 25%, if you will, of what's really needed to keep up with the amount of population growth we're experiencing in the United States. Now, get ready for point number seven. It's staggering and it's sad. Number seven, in 2050, now you got to remember we're in 2020, how many years to 2050? In 2050, the percentage of the U.S. population attending church will be almost half of what it was in 1990, meaning a drop from 20.4% of Americans attending church to 11.7%. If things continue the way they are, and that's the way pollsters and statisticians measure change, if things do not change at the current rate, in the next 30 years, we will grow, go from only 20.4% of Americans attending church to 11.7% of Americans attending church. Now, let's look at how a church begins grows, thrives, and then sometimes barely survives, and then sometimes dies. I want you to think about this as we go through the next few slides together. Here's a quote. You can write this on your bulletin or in your sermon notes. Mature, passionate Christians are the only people that can reach immature and worldly Christians and also lost people. I'll say it again. Mature, Passionate Christians are the only people that can reach immature and worldly Christians and also lost people. Now, let's walk through these next several slides together. All right, this is how a church starts out. You have a seed. What does the Bible in the New Testament call the seed? It's the gospel. You take the seed of the gospel. You take believers that already have accepted that seed of the gospel into their life. There's been a harvest, and now they're saved. So you plant the seed in a new community. Uh, so someone that's a believer goes out, and they're going to start a church. So they take the gospel into a city, into a community that needs it. Let's look at Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witness this is both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So what did Paul and Peter and Silas and Barnabas and a lot of other disciples do? They left Jerusalem and then they went into all Judea and then they went into Samaria and then they started going out into Asia and various places and starting to not only just share the gospel personally, but also they planted churches in every city and they even established elders in those churches. Remember Acts 14? And so there's personal evangelism, there's planting churches, they're setting up leadership in the churches, and then you go on and you do this in the next city, the next city, the next city, the next city, right? So let's look at this little process. You take the seed of the gospel and you take believers and you plant them in the ground. You plant them in the local community. And then what is required of all plants even church plants, as regular plants, they need water. The Bible talks about this one watered, this one plants, but God causes the increase, right? So we need to water those plants. Believers need to come into that local fellowship and then water all of the seeds of the gospel you're planting in the lost people's souls. And so you water the plants. And then as Jesus is holding the church in his hand, but God, you got to remember it's Jesus' church. It's not the pastor's church. And it's not your church. We say it's our church. We go to that church. But the church belongs to Jesus Christ. He's the one that came down here. He's the one that died on the cross. He's the one that spilled his blood for it. He's the one that died for it. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. The church lives or dies based upon Jesus Christ. Right? So you can see the picture there that the Lord has the church in his heavenly hands. And then you see the picture of the church where the church is starting to put down roots. You know, if a plant that you planted out in a field doesn't take root, it's not watered, it doesn't become healthy and start to put down roots, it's not going to make it. It's going to barely 
survive, and then probably die. You have to keep putting down roots. And the deeper the root system, the more healthy the root system, the healthier the church is above the ground, right? And so we want to see churches that are planted by the seed of the gospel and water them and then that church be in the palm of Jesus' hand. Because remember what we learned in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So that's what we need to look at is for our church and any other church that you know. And all churches are church plants. Did you know that all churches were planted? No church just existed. And so even Prestonwood Baptist Church in February of 1977, it was planted with 76 people. Yes, it's 30-something thousand now, but the seed of the gospel was planted. It was watered in 1977. In February, it only had 76 believers. When we started our church in um, uh, January the 10th of 2009, we started it with 61 people, right? So when you plant a church, you start it with the seed of the gospel and some born-again believers. Then you water it, and God's hand, it flourishes and grows, and then you start to put down deeper and deeper and deeper roots. All right, Acts 21, 5. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey. While they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city, after kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. This was the passage I was reading when I sensed very clearly from the Holy Spirit, this church was to be called the Journey Church. And I remember very clearly was when I read this, but think about this. When our days at our former church where I was an associate pastor, when our days of ministry there were ended, we left and started on our journey. They said goodbye to us. A lot of the people, we even cried with some of these people and they wished us well and they prayed for us and gave us Christian greetings to go and flourish. So while they all with wives and children escorted us until we were out of the city, after kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. We said goodbye to them. And we said hello to the colony and started planting a church plant there. And that was 11 years ago this coming Tuesday. So look at what Charles Spurgeon said in the middle of the 1800s. This wisdom will never change. If we want revivals, I keep hearing a lot today about people wanting revivals. I didn't hear much about revivals and people wanting revival until COVID. And now people are like, oh, we need revivals, we need revivals. Did you know there has to be a preparation of the heart for revivals to come. If we want revivals, how many of you, raise your hand if you want a revival, if you want to see revival come. Okay, if you want revivals, we must revive our reverence for the Word of God. Now, let's walk through three passages here. James chapter 4, 8 through 10, you can write these down, and this is something you can focus your heart and mind and actions on in your quiet time this week. James chapter 4, 8 through 10. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. That's pretty clear. If you will begin to draw near to God, what does the text promise you? God will draw near to you. Now, in reverse, if you don't draw near to God, He is not going to draw near to you. And a lot of us wonder why our lives are where they are, is that we've not drawn near to God, because God has promised Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What does that mean? Confess your sins. When you come to God, we come to Him dirty, filthy, nasty, and we need Him to cleanse us and to forgive us of all of our sins, just like 1 John 1, 9. Now look at verse 9. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Now, you would think that's written the other way around. Shouldn't we be talking about joy, joy, joy? God said, no. If you want revival, you need to mourn. If you really have the heart of revival and spiritual awakening, you know that something's wrong. You need to set aside your joy and you need to mourn. The people that are written about in our earth, in our American history, and England's history that really, really fought for revival and spiritual awakening in the 1700s and 1800s, they were mourners. They were prayers. They were fasting. They sought God. They confessed. And they really said, God, we have no other hope except in you. So turn your joy to gloom and mourn and seek the face of the Lord. Verse 10, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. You have to come before the Lord and humble yourself and say, Oh God, 
we find ourselves in a very bad place. We find ourselves in a very bad place. And I, just like my brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm a sinner, they're a sinner, and we're not living unto you. Our bodies of Christ are not living unto you. Our churches, small, medium, large, we're not living unto you. We cannot say that Christian right now is living an on-fire, passionate life in Christ and witnessing and seeing thousands of people come to faith in Christ regularly. It's not happening. We need revival. And so we're doing what you have taught us in James 4, 8 through 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. Now watch what happens. If you will humble yourself, he will exalt you. But the reverse is true. If you exalt yourself, he will humble you. Revival is all about drawing near to God, confessing your sins, weeping and mourning and getting right with God and letting him know that you understand how bad the situation is, humbling yourself in his presence and saying, I can't get any help unless you help me. And then let's look at what was said back in the Old Testament, Psalm 81, 15. Every believer needs to take serious note of this verse. Psalm 81, 15. Those who hate the Lord would pretend obedience to him and their time of punishment would be forever. There are a lot of people that think they're believers and they're not. There's a lot of people that try to act holy and they're not. And there are believers that run around trying to have a great reputation that they love the Lord and they serve Him, but their character is far from the reputation they've created. Those who hate the Lord would pretend obedience to Him. Let me ask you, church, right now, where are you pretending to obey God? Where are you pretending to obey God? You know you're not obeying. He knows you're not obeying. And maybe your other brothers and sisters have been blinded and they think you're obeying. But what is going on in your thought life or your personal life, your real life, that you are pretending like you are truly obeying God? God says, when you're pretending obedience to me, you're really telling me you hate me. If you loved me, you would obey me. If you pretend obedience, you hate me. So that's a very serious and powerful verse. Look at Psalm 85, 6. At the end of the day, we can't make revival come. All we can do is draw near to God and He'll draw near to us. We can confess our sins. We mourn and weep before His throne. We humble ourselves in the very presence of God. And then only God can grant revival. And this is where the psalmist said, will you not yourself revive us again? What does the again mean? You have revived us in the past. I remember my ancients and fathers talking about it. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? God, I'm asking you to bring revival so that your people who are now worldly and carnal and apathetic and living for the ways of this world can one day be those that rejoice in you, love you, serve you, give to you, witness about you, and give you praise and honor and glory. Because right now, 20% of Americans attend church. In the next 30 years, it's projected that 11.7% will come and attend worship and give God the glory to His holy name. Where are you in this? Are you the mature, passionate believer and you're making a difference in the body of Christ and you're considering how to stimulate others along to love and good deeds and how to get to worship regularly and work through their, their rationalizations and their poor excuses for not worshiping with the body of Christ, the bride of Christ? Where are you in worship? If you're a member of this church, get to worship. Get to worship. Even if you have to wear a mask and come to worship. I would rather come to worship and get sick with COVID than to stay home and not get COVID and not give glory and praise and honor to my God. There is always a cost of discipleship. And if it's not COVID, it's going to be something else. We live in a very dangerous world every day. You can be hit by a car. You can be taken hostage. You can die. You can die of an illness or a heart attack. Anything can happen to you. You can get cancer and die. We're going to die of something or Jesus is going to come back first. One of the two. You're going to die or Jesus is going to return before you die. But if you do die, you're going to die of something. Whatever you die of, let God be seeing you worship him regularly and bring him glory. Amen? Well, TJC, this church was planted on Tuesday, August 25th of 2009. We give all praise, honor, and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our King, and the head of the church. Amen? 
Let's make the next few years, if he's granting us years, if he would be merciful to give us more years as a church family, let's decide that we're going to not turn back. Once we put our hand to the plow, we're going to move forward and we're going to expect that God is going to cause the increase of this one local body of believers because he cares about the souls that lives within the perimeter and circumference of this church. Amen? Let's stand and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. All hail the name of Jesus Christ.